Hello, this is Henry Gordon Smith, founder of agritecture.com, and we're here again for an exciting webinar interview with one of our agritecture innovators. Agritecture is all about integrating agriculture into the built environment, finding synergies with buildings and spaces that maximizes the use of both agriculture and the building itself. I'm here with Carlos Guzman, who's studying at the Boston Architectural College and has been doing some work on integrating agriculture into buildings in the Dominican Republic. How are you doing, Carlos? Hi, Henry, how are you? I'm doing fine. Yeah, I'm great. It's a bit early in the morning for both of us, but we're here sharing ideas, trying to inspire others, so uh, it'll invigorate us. Carlos came by uh, my office uh, not too long ago to share some of his ideas and get some feedback on his project, and so I'm really excited uh, to share some of that with our audience today and learn more about it. So Carlos, why don't you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself and then we'll get into your concept and what you came up with. All right, thank you, Henry. Uh, so I'm Carlos, I'm from the Dominican Republic. I uh, graduated um, in the Dominican Republic for, with an architecture degree in 2010. Uh, I, I practiced uh, architecture for a couple of years doing di all sorts of different kinds of projects. Um, and in 2014, I moved to Boston, uh, went to the Ar Boston Architectural College. Um, I finished a master's degree in architecture there um, in last year in December, actually. And I, you know, have experience working on all, all sorts of different projects, including affordable housing, retail, um, a little bit of institutional. And what I did for my degree, well, my degree project, my thesis project was working with a just trying to find a, a way to uh, fix a, a, a very important problem for me that's happening in the Dominican Republic. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's where I'm at now. So now after I finished that degree, I became so interested in, you know, how to, how to integrate agriculture with uh, buildings that I'm now pursuing a, a, master's, a master's in landscape architecture. And I'm hoping to, and I'm sort of getting that exposure to, you know, plants and, and all these different things about the built environment that I hadn't had exposure to before. And now I'm trying to navigate those waters and see if I can find ways to incorporate the, the two disciplines. Wow, what an exciting journey. And it sounds like it's just the beginning. You've got a lot more ahead of you. So uh, let's dive in here. It might take a moment. We're gonna pull up uh, some of Carlos's work and, and, and talk about it. All right. So I'm gonna start with showing you this image. You can see this image? Yeah. So this is what's called a colmado in the Dominican Republic, uh, which is basically a very um, sort of rural looking and vernacular little marketplace um, that's very important in Dominican culture um, because not only it functions to provide grocery stores to uh, a lot of different uh, people, but it also functions as a very um, social place um, you see that all of these different uh, colmados are very important for the social cohesion of people in the country. Um, you can see, you can see a lot of people hanging out there most of the days. Uh, it's also like the colmado is also a disco. It's also a bar. Um, so like there are all these different things that happen in this place that are so important for the Dominican culture. And like I myself, when I was growing up, I used to hang in one of these places in my neighborhood and just like hang out with my friends and like drink sodas and eat chips and just like hang out. And I found myself doing the same thing even when I was older, but this time we were just doing like maybe drinking beer and even hanging out, dancing sometimes. And so what's striking about this place is that you would think that because it's so important and it's spread across like everywhere in the country, um, you would think that it, it, it would its significance would be kind of something that was obvious and it really isn't in fact uh, in the last few years you we've I've seen a lot of these different businesses uh, just go bankrupt and disappear um, so a lot of these uh, places that you knew in a neighborhood that was a very distinct place of that neighborhood now all of a sudden they're gone and so this is a trend that's been happening for the last decade and it's mostly or in large part due to the rise of these like giant supermarket chains that are spread across the country. Um, and a bunch of these things are also like international uh, supermarkets and, and even like online retailers. So 
this move towards like how we are getting food and how people purchase food and how people um, sort of their relationship with their the things that they um, eat, right? Um, it's something that got me really interested. And particularly because the more supermarkets there are in the country, the less of these places are. And the more people will have kind of have that experience and have that connection to the culture. And so what I set out to do was basically um, think about and, and, and integrate how to, how to develop architecture around this particular project. And one of the things that I started um, studying was, you know, uh, basically how do colmados get there? So you have three main typologies for what a colmado is. Essentially you have one that's on the, you know, on the ground floor and it's a little small building. Second one is, is a two story building and, and first floor is, is family or residential and the second floor is, is the colmado store. And then a third type, which is basically you have a colmado store on the ground floor and some people living on the, on the, on the second floor. So, you know, just to dive in a little bit about the typology of that. But the important thing here was that their supply chain basically is represented in this diagram. So I compared how do supermarkets get their food and how to, or, or, or get their products and how do colmados get their products. And basically what I discovered is that, you know, supermarkets, which is this guy in blue and the colmados in red here and this little diagram, Supermarkets get their products internationally, and they also get them from local whole food, uh, local wholesalers that get that then get their products from the you know the farmers uh, outside of the city. Um, so in this sort of food supply model, the wholesalers have pretty much control over the colmado, and so the colmados don't really control their prices. They they don't dictate anything uh, as part of the, this business which is what's kind of like screwing them up at the end, right? Um, and so what I set out to do was basically, okay, so what if, what if we imagine, you know, we want to take advantage of the vast ne network of Colmado stores, right? What if we imagine that we can incorporate some kind of farming component to them? We can teach them how to grow their food so that they can actually start producing uh, the food that they actually sell so that they kind of take charge of their own destiny, right? And so we forget about the whole food sailors or the whole uh, the wholesalers, right? And so the way to do this or the way that I envisioned you would do this was you create one, um, let's call it a Comal distribution center, which is basically owned by a, by a, by a conglomerate of different Comado owners, right? And they sort of get together, they get some, you know, maybe some financings from the, from the, from the state through microloans or, or different kinds of methods. So they set out this building that would produce food and that would supply food to the Colmado stores um, so that they can in turn sell and have sort of take charge of the production line. And so, um, you know, I, I, I started to speculate on, you know, what would this mean for the existing typology and what are the bigger changes of this, of implementing this system on the country and on this place that are, that is so important for Dominican culture. Right. And, um, you know, I started to do some diagrams and, and sort of try to explain the conceptually how, how would this play out. And if we start imagining these little stores with, you know, all of a sudden some rooftop gardens and things like that, and, and like it would completely change how we perceive these places. And that was something that I, that I, that I was very interested in exploring as well. But the, the, the main takeaway of implementing this system is that now you have a, now you have a, 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 a different sort of building typologies that could emerge. All throughout the city and this is similar to what happened in Cuba because uh, because Cuba has this uh, urban agricultural system as part of their food supply uh, different like little building typologies brought out uh, uh, one of them being like uh, the seed houses right where people go and actually buy seeds so it's this little store that you know fulfills this objective or, or, or teaches you how to how to how to grow certain things right so now you have this these like different specialized places because you have this overall uh, system to grow food. And so what I sort of speculated was like, okay, so this new model would set out to, would, would sort of um, set, set, the, set in motion a change that would create, you know, maybe there's one building that is 
strictly a, a vegetable farm, right? And it has a learning component to it. A second one would be, you know, one that does like animal farm, um, you know, that would have pigs and would have chickens and, 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 and would also trade to the Colmado stores, right? And then a third one would be, it's a, it's a community garden that's owned, you know, by the same conglomerate and, and distributes whatever's grown in there. You have a, you know, a composting facility as part of this overall um, urban agricultural model. And then a, a fifth one, you could have even have a, a recycling uh, sort of facility, right? And it all ties back into uh, this network, you know, that I kind of represented on this diagram here. This network of like over 150,000 uh, uh, Colmado stores in the country. So to put that in, in, into perspective, um, I kind of have a, a chart here. Let me see. Because I, I always use the example of I always use the example with the bodega in New York City. Right, it's a similar typology. Maybe it's, a sim not. it's a similar typology, right? So I did, as part of the, you know, as part of my research, I, I, I looked up like, because I also researched like, what is the history of the grocery store in general? And this is, a, it's a very, it's a very interesting story because, you know, it's it sort of, uh, it's sort of influenced by like, you know, technology. You know, because like when you didn't have refrigerators, for example, like grocery stores was completely different. So, right. You know, a bunch of different things that uh, resulted from like technology and urban sprawl. But uh, essentially, the important thing about here is that, um, you know, New York or Manhattan is 23 square miles. Um, San Domingo is 35 uh, square miles. And there are 3,000 um, bodegas in, in it's called wow. 3,000 roughly. So yeah. it's like you almost have half of uh, twice the size, but like you have like three times as many Colmados. Yeah. yeah. And there's a, this is only like the unregistered ones. So you have way more. Sorry, this is like registered Colmados. You have way more unregistered Colmados. So like, and it sounds like they're also bigger. Like they also have some spaces for, like you said, other cultural activities that bodegas don't always. Like you see people hanging out at bodegas, but they're not usually, you know, dancing there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. So, so if they're actually smaller because you know bodegas typically have a a, a little storage basement in the bottom. Oh, okay, that's true. Um, and by definition, a bodega is so here's the duration of use. You can see that the Colmado has, people spend more time in the Colmado because they're doing all these social activities like dancing and drinking and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So because you have that component to it, you can't really stock your stores too much. So you have to leave some space for that. So that's something that the bodegas, if when you think about them, they're always like super packed. Yeah. You, like you, you really don't have a lot of space to walk around in there. Um, so the, the, the difference with the Colmado is that they carry less products. Um, most of them, like 80% of them, are actually local products. So that's another thing that I sort of, you know, it ties back into why, you know, what what is the reason to, why do we have to save them, so to speak, is because there's this huge component of like local brands, local industry that, you know, distributes their products through the Colmado like venue and network. And so if we see as a country we see them starting to disappear, then we're gonna to start to see a lot of like rippling effects of that, sure. uh, of that thing. And so, you know, and, and this is something that's also, it's a phenomenon that's also occurring in, 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 the, in this country. Uh, when I was, um, when I was uh, doing the research, I spoke with um, the, 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 there's an association called Asobeo, which is an association of bodega owners of the United States. And the, I, I met with the president of, of that uh, uh, institution. And they sort of like, I'm trying to find this uh, image so I can show you this, but uh, thanks. It was really funny because they were thinking about Uh, I'm not going to be able to find that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but they, uh, the, he showed me this publication that they have. Apparently they have a, a, a like a, a bodega owner 
you know, monthly magazine or whatever, which was kind of cute. Um, but they essentially, like, he showed me his last cover when I spoke to him, and it was like the healthy or the fresh bodega model. So they, as, a, as, as owners of this thing, they're also thinking about this, like, man, how can we start, you know, uh, sort of selling healthier food to people, you know, which, uh, which I thought was interesting. But yeah, that is, a, that is interesting. But it sounds yeah. like these groups, you know, the, their margins are so small and they're, they, you know, although they work together, yeah. a, they, they probably need a lot of guidance to, to kind of get yes. through that. Yes, exactly. And, and not only that, but um, one thing that I discovered and while I sort of like, I could frame this problem as a globalized problem and it becomes a thing about um, what's the problem with our current food supply model and what type of monopolies this model is like monoculture farming, what type of right. monopolies it's setting itself to kind of create. Right. Yeah. So it's really leaving. It's not, it's not giving any control or any say for the smaller, you know, grocery store owner, smaller bodega owner, they're not part of the food production process. Right. Right. And There's so connection there. Yeah. Right. Which is basically, you know, once you take that into account and you take into account the fact that, you know, they probably have increasing operational costs because they have, you know, rent to pay and it, that rent is increasing. And so, you know, their margins are becoming lower and their, their expenses are, you know, their overhead is, is larger. So, um, and there's actually no guarantees that the next generation will culturally support them either by even just right. buying something like beer that maybe keeps them running. They might not hang out there in the future as they move towards more of an extractive supermarket model. Right. Exactly. So exactly. It's, it's, and, yeah, it's really a cultural and, and system threat. Yeah. And it's also like this thing of like, these places are, are, are very interesting in the sense that they provide uh, diversity to the neighborhood and they, they sort of cre create this interesting dynamic right with what's already there and it's the same thing with like the colmado because you know you, you, you will you will never find I just saw this photo you will never find this right right in a supermarket <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> yeah no. so like this this is a very interesting image because in the whoa <laughs> in the background, in the background, you see, you know, yeah, all yeah. the products, yeah. you know, and probably in the back, you're going to, you there's a, probably a, a freezer with like, you know, chickens and things like that mm -hmm. that you can, you, you can purchase. So maybe, you know, maybe she over, over here was just looking to buy some eggs and then there was a party going on. You know what I mean? Right. And met some neighbors, met some friends, changed plans. Exactly. Exactly. So there's this important... We have so few spaces like this in the world, you know, and in, and in cities these days. Uh, exactly. And yeah. so there's, there's this push of like, you know, and, and it's, and it's interesting because it's all, it all ties back into food, right? It's like, there's this, uh, you know, food supply model that's pushing towards like a, a, a homogenization of spaces through like, you know, big box supermarkets and, and, and things like that. So Carlos, show us uh, a bit of, you know, what you ended up with. So how did you integrate this? How did you try and maintain that cultural experience, but also bring in local food? Yes. So basically, um, let me show you this. This is an aerial photo of the, of the building. Um, and so a lot of things I, try to incorporate here it's basically a um it's a it's a there's a there's a, like i said it's a, it's it's there's a learning component to it to this building there's also the food production component to it right and so what's what i'm mostly using as part of the building design is a you know a, a, a ebb and flow greenhouse over here which you would grow essentially tomatoes and other types of uh, vine uh, vegetables. But you also have a sort of community farm here at the, at the entrance. Um, and, and that community farm is, is made out of, let me see if I can find a, So much work, so much content goes into these projects. So it's always yeah. amazing to see. <laughs> yeah. So let me show you this. So basically, 
Okay. You go through this entrance and this this is kind of your food forest. Beautiful. You have like some, you know, fruit trees like oranges and things like that. So this is obviously a public uh, endeavor here. So, you know, you're free to go in and pick up, you know, an orange from the tree or a banana or something like that. Right. Um, and so this, this garden is made out of, uh, you know, uh, yeah, reuse crates. Yeah, reuse crates. So, so it, it 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 creates the opportunity to to not only have some kind of flexibility uh, on the space, and and you could end up you know having like you know social events like this um, mm -hmm. that ties back into that community sort of importance. Um, but you you know you you can also do your your your, your gardening classes or or or, or your, your planting part of your, uh, your planting program in the building uh -huh. so one of the important things that I look into and this is why the crates come to you know fruition is because as part of the, like the building uh, typology and I was interested in like looking into the vernacular of the Colmado store and I found this thing that's very important for the Colmado store which is like all these plastic crates yeah those plastic crates are used to carry things around uh, in the store and transport but they're also attached to motorcycles that are you know delivery mm -hmm. so they take your groceries to your house uh, on these things and this is a very important uh, image because everybody recognizes this as like a colmado delivery motorcycle you know so That's it's cool. all it, there's this crate component to it um and so i looked into like you know i could use that crate as a part of a you know building assembly Right. I loved this one. When I first saw this, I thought this was a really clever approach because it brings in color and aesthetic yes. as well. But it, but it, it you know, it, it's, it's also simple, right? Yeah, It's super simple and accessible. It's yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, if you do that on a, on a second, on a second floor, for example, you could end up with that, but you could also have, uh, you could also have, you could also, you know, set up your planter, uh, on a, on a, on a, so you can use it as a, as a, as a living wall, right? And, right. I, and there's a similar uh, approach to this done in, uh, I can't remember what exactly what project, it's in Atlanta. Um, it's uh, what, uh, Atlanta Botanical Garden. I, I can't remember exactly what it is, but um, you could use it, you know, you could use it as a living wall component. You could maybe you know it, it yeah people it might so take it home. people might be inspired and do it at home as well in their garden right. or their, their right. balcony because it's such a familiar typology so right it's like and, those, uh, those tentacles of the of the the the, the culture yes kind of spread through the city yeah yeah and you know i was imagining like we, this would be like a living sort of thing because you would take crates off and put them back on and just like it ties back into that if we see this uh drawing here set this to okay so there we see some of the hydroponics happening inside the greenhouse yes. right. you can probably see this image better here yeah um, so it ties back can i zoom in on this there we go so it ties back you you, you we can't see it really well here because there's a there's a ramp component to it but it's, it ties back into the activity outside here with the community farm made out of crates and obviously this is your this is your shading for the for the nft hydroponic racks in here but in the interior of the building you have sort of an atrium space that would be you know the it's kind of a plant nursery so you would go in and you would you know get your information um, see all the different uh, hydroponic equipment that you could purchase in the same store. Um, but also see this like big living wall in the center of the space. Um, and that's all, you know, letting light inside through, uh, through you know, just the, just the main materials of the building and the orientation, um, which you would notice it, you know, this setback. Mm -hmm uh over here let me just ask you a couple of questions while we're looking at that one um yep. and you know i talked to a lot of architects and and you know now it sounds like you're interested in pursuing more ways to integrate plants into buildings through your landscape architecture degree mm -hmm. what, what were some of the greatest challenges you faced when you were 
thinking about or pursuing integrating agriculture into this project? So um, one of the bigger challenges was um, there's not a lot of people that are doing this in terms of um, they're, they're approaching it more as a, um, uh, a hardware a problem as like, oh, you could put that anywhere, you know? Um, so there's, there's a, there's not a lot of information about, about it. That's what, that was one of the challenges. The other challenge was just getting to getting familiarized with these, uh, systems that I had no experience with. They, I mean, nobody teaches this at architecture school, which I think is something that has to change in a way, because you, we're going to see more and more of this becoming part of the, you know, food supply, or at least you know, we have to incorporate it because of, you know, growing urban population. Right. Um, but also like to, to what's having a more sustainable future. Um, and so, um, and, and the other challenge I would say is like, these systems already have their own parts, nuts and bolts and, and such. And so incorporating them as part of the architecture is also a challenge. And, and I thought of, I sort of started at, at, uh, suggesting that here at how the exactly the um the the greenhouse works mm -hmm. because since it's an ebb and flow system um you know you need a big pretty big reservoir and i and i and i try to sort of suggest that how do how do i uh integrate that as part of like the building um, mm. part so as part of the floor assembly um i started like suggesting or sort of like uh investigating how do you incorporate that ebb and flow system and water reservoir inside the, the, the floor assembly um and what would that mean for you know uh, the way you the way you would design that you know particular building element um but also you know uh how do you do a, a, a greenhouse in a way that's like it's still kind of contextually aware um contextually sensitive like it's using the materials of, right it's not quite commercial but it's also you know integrated right. really it's just integrated so yeah how do you balance that because you know when you look at greenhouses it's really just about the technical it's it's like this is right right exactly and here. also like how do you orient it like all these different things and i did you know as part of like the design process i did a few like weather simulations to kind of understand uh you know where the sun was uh how how was wind affecting uh the how how i mean essentially how, what's the weather like you know and so to kind of like prove my design in terms of like oh it functions because of this and that right so you know the orientation of the building and and, and the way i set it up in the site is takes mostly into consideration you know the, the direction of the wind and the direction of the sun. So I wanted to orient and have as much sun space on the front of the building, which was, you know, where the south orientation was. And, you know, I oriented to the east because I, I didn't want this to be a, a, uh, a something that was like very high tech because, yeah. where the, because of its location. I mean, it has to be, and it's also located in one of the poorest neighborhoods in sure. the country. Um, so uh yeah so by orienting and taking advantage of like all the uh, already existing conditions i started looking into you know if i orient this east to west i can get i can get that uh sort of maximum uh wind exposure right and i could use that to kind of like um sort of cool my greenhouse great so you talked about you know how some there's some education gaps right that maybe in architecture school there should be um, maybe some guest instruction or some instruction on on kind of these emerging forms of of agriculture but really really any yeah. kind still needs to be taught um, you know I I feel like maybe in landscape architecture they do a little bit on on kind of gardens and some food producing elements maybe a little bit on green walls but even that's quite quite new. So yeah. when you go to something like you know commercial scale or at least commercial systems for agriculture. You almost see none of that. So, you know, it sounds like that you think that's something that that could help um, both architects and, and cities kind of move forward with with the potential of of this kind of approach. What else do you think might be needed, or or what else do you think are some gaps that are preventing, let's say, models like this, which we often see in 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 design stage, um, but we don't really see them becoming a reality. 
you know, what are some of the gaps you think that that could be filled in the coming years to, to help get more of these projects realized? Um, I think some of the gaps is just like people are just not taking this seriously enough and they're just not aware of, uh, I mean, most people don't actually put a lot of thought into like food. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of just, it's just a given. And so, and this is something that, you know, I'd never thought about it until I started like getting into the research and understanding the, the implications of, of, of the whole system. Right. Um, and I think this is something that's also uh, sort of a, a, a challenge in its own way because, I mean, if you're if you if you don't know about something, you don't you're not interested in in, in trying to you know sort of help the cost, right? Or trying to put put effort into it. Um, yeah, I think those yeah. are I think those are like the the, the main things of of what it what it entails to design one of these spaces. It's just that you you're not going to get any knowledge from this from from as part of your degree in architecture um at least not specifically not unless there's like a very particular studio you know like a design studio that was about like you know food and food in the food in the city or something like that but mm -hmm. um i don't think it's it's not part of any curriculum yeah no definitely well it's really um it's really uh, thorough, uh, well thought out and attractive work, Carlos. So, uh, you know, we're really grateful for your time today and sharing these ideas. And uh, we wish you the best with your next degree and hope to see you around at some of the events. But how can uh, somebody connect with you and how can somebody learn more about this work and other work you've done, Carlos? Um, so I have a working website. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's Carlos Guzman, G-U-Z-M-A-N uh, dot X-Y-C. Um, you know, my contact information is there. Um, and then uh, Instagram, you know, Charlie Guzman. Uh, and, you know, that's around, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, thanks so much. You heard it here on Agritecture, all about integrating agriculture into the bodegas of the Dominican Republic. Want to send a big thanks to Carlos Guzman. Yeah, and, thank you, uh, Henry. Thanks, everyone, for watching.